it up. Oh, I'm sorry. There you go. Um, so, we, the question of the week from last week, is it okay to give marijuana to those who are dying of cancer? For those of you who are against cancer, this is going to be a hard... I mean, against <laughs> marijuana. Hopefully, you're all against cancer. Wow. Those of you who are against marijuana, this is going to be a difficult question. If you're for marijuana, then this really isn't going to be that difficult of a question. So, what do you guys think? It depends on how, how bad. Okay. So, like, could you elaborate a little bit? Well, if it's in stage four, five, or six, the worst is the worst, and I don't see why not. Uh, okay. And uh, did you read the read the chapter thirty one? No. Okay. All right. That's what my next question. So if you didn't read it, I don't have to ask that question. Nicole. Um, I would say yeah, actually. Okay. And, um, and I did read ahead, uh -huh. and it does say that you give a strong drink to the one who is perishing. And one to those in better distress. Okay. So, I mean, if it's helping them, at least okay. pain-wise, I don't see what, how it would hurt. Okay. Just to ease the pain. Okay. Any other ideas? Any ideas? I think yes. Yeah? Okay. Oh, were you going to say You give them morphine and stuff. Right, and right. Pain, so you might as well. Right. All right. It's I didn't expect you guys to come to a, a, such a conclusion so easy. <laughs> I thought you guys were going to have to do some soul searching here. <laughs> huh? Huh? Well, okay. Um, Diana, did you have anything? Same thing with Basil. Okay. D Gracie? Um, same thing that Nicole said. <laughs> you can't piggyback on somebody else's answer. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. Okay. So let's look at uh, Proverbs 31 then. Um, <clears throat> now... Verses 1 through 9 are separate from 10 through 31. Uh, 1 through 9 are uh, from a guy, uh, King Lemuel. Um, okay. And, uh, yeah. And actually, the thing is, it's not even him who said it. Um, it actually shows his mother is the source of the wisdom on this, which is actually very important, because remember, we we're talking about trying to, find, trying to look past... Here's what happened, okay? God created men and women for their different roles and stuff like that, right? But then over the, over the years, men just kind of dominated women like they dominate everything. Men like to take control of things. So, lo and behold, they took control over women, too. I mean, that it, we didn't have to look real hard to see that one was going to happen. Uh, and so then what happened is because men have a tendency to dominate, they started translating everything in the Bible to cater to their male-centered theology. To keep them in absolute control over the women and the women and without where they couldn't do things, right? So then, throughout the years, eventually, uh, a movement got going called feminism, which sought to not make women equal to men, but sought to take away the distinction of woman from man, and sought to, in many ways, um, over dominate. The, the woman over the male, which I don't think really resolves the issue because then you still have an imbalance. So with that being said, and without going too much into it, because we kind of already talked about that at all, I mean, I talked about that to some extent, um, it's important to notice what Proverbs 31 says specifically about women. And the first thing it says here is King Lemuel's mother is the source of wisdom here. Really an important point. Um, so we see, uh, obviously, woman's place of... of, of being fully capable to give wisdom. I think that's that's pretty important, um, especially because a lot of times um, people have gone to the extreme of saying women have no place of talking in a church. They have no place of leadership in a church. They have no, so, so you have all these really extreme views, and, and you, you're you faced with the modern world, and, and you have to ask yourself, do these things... Um, are these things immoral, or are they are these things tradition? You know, and you really have to try and figure it through. So... Anyways, uh, in verses 2 through 3, what are you doing, my son? What are you doing inside of my room? <laughs> Have you guys ever seen it, crowd? There's this part where the main character, one of the main characters, his name's Roy, and he's all talking to the psychiatrist, and he's like, Not that I'm attracted to my mother. No, I can, I can just hear her now. What are you doing, Roy? What are you doing? <laughs> and it just... <laughs> oh my gosh, you guys need to see it at least once. It's for Anyways, I'm sorry. What are you doing, my son? What are you doing, son of my boom? What are you doing, son of my vows? Do not give your strength to women, your ways to those who destroy kings. 
Uh, here he's she's either, either worrying about two different things, and both are are actually completely um, reasonable. The first one, it seems like he, like she's saying uh, lust or adultery or or uh, prostitutes or something like that. Uh, do not give your strength to women, your way to those who destroy kings. But also she might she might be talking in a more broad broader sense of waywardness of heart. Don't 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 lose yourself in. Oh, I fell in love with this person. I fell in love with this. Keep your heart in check. You know what I mean? Don't don't just let your heart have free reign here. You're a king. You know you need to wind it in, for lack of better words. Um, so both both uh, understandings there are totally acceptable. It just really depends on what emphasis you give to to where in the sentence. Um, verse four: It is not for kings, little Emil. It is not for kings to drink wine. Or for rulers to take strong drink, lest they drink and forget what has been decreed and pervert the rights of all the afflicted. Give strong drink to those who, to the one who is perishing, and wine to those in bitter distress. Let them drink and forget their poverty and remember their misery no more. Um, so a few, a lot of things are going on here. Let's kind of look at them one at a time. First half, in four through five, no excessive use or dependence on it, uh, especially for leaders. L look how he says this. Um, it's not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine. Now, why would she say that? Because this is King Lemuel. Uh -huh. This is the king. So she's telling him, don't be partaking of this. Why? What is the reason? Lest, you, lest they drink and forget what has been decreed. So lest you become an immoral king. You for, you uh, you know take advantage of people. You're an unjust king. Um, and pervert the rights of all the afflicted. So uh, she, he, she's kind of talking here about... Um, Obviously, two different understandings here. First, as I mentioned, excessive use. Just the abuse of alcoholic beverages. I remember, um, for a king to abstain completely from alcohol was completely unheard of at this time. Yeah. She's probably more likely talking about the abuse of alcohol. Um, and then the second thing here uh, that, she, that she could potentially be talking about uh, is the dependence on it. Um, it's kind of hinted to, I don't really prefer that reading, but I think that it's true either way you know it, it went when 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 you're in a kind of a place and you go to that so and without getting too much into that though um but notice how she is talking to leaders especially and and then in six six through seven she kind of switches switches um uh kind of direction and notice how six through seven is a contrast to four through five okay right. now let me kind of explain that give strong drink to the one who is perishing and wine to those in bitter distress let them forget uh, uh, drink and forget their poverty and remember their misery no more so first off, uh, she's talking about a pain reliever. When somebody's in ag agony, you would you don't hold withhold their medicine from them. Okay. Paul said the exact same thing to Timothy when he said, "No longer drink just water, but drink a little bit of wine too. It's it's going to help you feel better." Um, so let's kind of focus on on the point of it. There, it is definitely a pain reliever. I know a lot of people get would get mad at me if I was telling people that it's okay to have marijuana if you're dying, but I mean. I definitely see the the pull of it. You know, I, I definitely understand that. When you have a stomach ache or something, do you take Tylenol? Do you take ibuprofen? Do you, do you take you know Aleve or whatever? Well, why is it okay for you to take that and for someone else not take something to help their death? Yeah. See what I mean? I'm not talking about recreational marijuana where you're just smoking and getting high all the time and, and making yourself you know useless. I'm talking about where you're actually doing something you know to. It gets pretty painful for those of you who have ever had a had a disease where it's a it's a constant pain. Um, I mean, I had that constant pain when I went to the hospital, and that was just for a couple months of solid pain, and it was getting better. So now, pretend I wasn't getting better, and pretend pretend it was way worse of a pain. So I mean, kind of hard to say that, um, and, and that's really the heart of what he's saying here is, is to the, uh, what she's saying: give strong drink to the one who is perishing. Uh, but then also, there's kind of a balance here between trusting God and a temporary fix. See, what people say oftentimes is, well, aren't you trusting God? Well, yeah. So why are you going to your cancer treatments? Uh, well, aren't you trusting God? Chuck, aren't you trusting God? Why are you still on dialysis? You know see what I mean? A lot of times people take that whole trusting God to the extreme. Yeah. And yes, we should trust God in everything, but we should also remember that... God, God, yeah, God gave us the means to, to, to do things, you know. Uh, if I wouldn't have gone to the doctor, I would have died. It's already a miracle that I didn't have permanent effects on, on my organs. And they said multiple times, I don't know how, but you're you're looking great. You're, you're doing fine. Well, okay, cool. My my old professor from Saigu, uh, Dr. Bartel, he got in, in a car wreck, uh, I think it was this week. Uh, his car is total. It's just gone. I mean, there's, it's just, it's just looks terrible. 
Um, and he did, he's fine. He has a little bit of soreness in some of his muscles. His wife, Sher uh, Sharon, was with him. And uh, she ha she's going to have to go through a little bit of surgery. But, I mean, the, the doctor said multiple times, it makes no sense that you're alive. You know, And that's kind of what I'm talking about. So Sharon shouldn't go get the surgery for her neck? <laughs> See what I mean? Like, there's a balance here between trusting God. Yes, absolutely trust God. And even if you do have to be on medication and stuff like that, that doesn't mean you, you cease trusting in God. But see, God gave wisdom to all Right, people. right, exactly. Right. Exactly. That, can use it. Yes, right. absolutely. Like the, thing, like the thing with Dr. Kidney, for instance. Just because he has to go to dialysis doesn't mean he stops trusting in God. No. Wow. See what I mean? There's, there's definitely a balance there. Um, so obviously, you know, there's, there's, there's temporary fixes. Um, I don't know, I want to get into that. Um, and, but also, there does need to be a little bit of a, of a word of warning here. She's not saying, run from your problems and, and, and it's okay to abuse things. Okay? That's not what she's saying. Okay? Um, so it gives strong drink. Everything is in moderation. Right, right, right. Well, obviously, when you're going through severe pain, you're going to have to do a little bit more than moderation, you well, know, because right. you're yeah. medicating. Yeah. But ultimately, yes, yes, that's true. Uh, give strong drink to the one who is perishing, and wine to those in bitter distress. Let them drink and forget. See, that that's where we get held up. Forget their poverty. So you're saying that if there's somebody's poor and they're and they're and they're, they should just keep drinking and, and, and cause them to forget. No, she's talking about someone in severe anguish. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, anyways, I think we've kind of clarified that. Any questions on that? No? Okay. So obviously there's a clear contrast between poor decisions and excessive pain. See, at the beginning she says not to drink for leaders because she, how it affects your decision making. Right. Which right. people who are in pain, obviously it's going to affect their decision making too, but so does pain. Right. Have you ever been in so much pain that you would literally do anything to get out of it? Uh -huh. It affects your decision making, doesn't it? That's kind of what I'm talking about. Uh, but then on the other side of that spectrum is the um, is the not withholding it for excessive pain. So kind of a balance between you know, and obviously you're gonna you're gonna know the difference. You know, um, I would say this: if you're having financial debt, you don't need to go and get drunk every day. You need to learn how to manage your money, which is probably one of the reason one of the places it's going to is probably the alcohol. Uh, we're not talking about that. We're talking about excessive pain and and, and and that kind of stuff. Not running from problems. Okay. Again, I knew I knew a woman uh, who had cancer, and she just she just went on shutdown mode until she died. I know another woman who had cancer that was full of joy, and she's still living. I mean, I'm not saying joy is the deciding factor there of whether they lived or died. My point being that you don't have to give up. Your trust can still be in, in God, even if you have to medicate. That's the point. Okay. Uh, the only part where people say I don't go to the doctor is usually fear, and then they they take that fear. And then take parts of the Bible to justify that fear, like the part where the, where the king was sick, and it says, even then he didn't trust, trust in God, but he went to the doctors. What they're saying there is that he didn't trust God at all. Then he got sick, and he still didn't trust in God. It's not whether or not he went to the doctor or not. It's okay to go to the doctor. But our trust has to remain on God. That's the, that's the thing. So saying it's that, uh, contrasting, uh, there's a, another contrast here between helping others uh, and crippling yourself. Okay, King Lemuel, you're the king. It's not for kings to drink wine and to drink and to take strong drink, unless you forget what has been decreed in Virgin. However, don't cripple yourself. However, you should be helping others. Give strong drink to the one who's perishing. Give it to them. Help others who are hurting. But for you, it's not a good thing for you to do this. You have to make decisions. You have to make sure justice is being served. Right? See, see the contrast there? Um, <clears throat> and then that leads straight into verses 8 through 9. Open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all who are destitute. Open your mouth, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and needy. See, in between this thing, don't drink because it's going to cause you to, to, to pervert justice. And then you hop down to 8, nine, eight through 9 and she ta ta talks about being a just person. Open your mouth for the mute, stand up for other people. But in between that is a little is a little thing. Just because you should abstain from al alcohol as a leader doesn't mean you should withhold alcohol from those who are in pain. See? She's not commenting at all about people people's abuse of alcohol. She's not coming about people uh, running from their problems. She's saying, help those who are in need. No. Um, uh, the, to, to put it in a, in a, in a modern-day con contrast, um, 
pastor. It's not wise for you to take a bunch of medications that can affect your thinking while you're an acting pastor. However, you shouldn't teach that they shouldn't take medication just because I'm trying to I want you to do your job with a clear mind. So then it brings up the question, well, what if a pastor does have to do something like that where he has to take a mind-altering medication or something like that? I would personally recommend finding someone else to fill in, stepping down for a time being, handing right. temporarily handing leadership over to an associate pastor, that kind of stuff. Right. Because if you're not in a right mind to make decisions, that's a large part of pastoring. So you're going to have to find a solution. Uh, but anyways, um, okay. Okay. Uh, that takes us to the wife of character. In verses 10 through 31, there's just this break. Uh, out of nowhere, uh, to where he start talk starts talking about um, of the wife. We don't know who wrote this. We don't know if this is part of King, King Lemuel's not a thing that's going on. We don't know if this is the words of anger continued from chapter 30. We don't know if this is Solomon. We don't know if this is Hezekiah. We don't know who did this. Just there at the end of Proverbs, the closing thing is the wife of character. So there's a few things to look at here before we even look at, at the verses themselves. The first is it's not an I mean it is an ideal. It's not a comparison. You should not compare your wife to the standard. You as a wife should not com compare yourself. You see what I mean? You shouldn't beat yourself up that you're not this list is what I'm saying. It's good to compare yourself with the ways of wisdom and say, how can I approve? Yes, that's okay. But when, when it's a thing of beating yourself up or being beat up, like Pat, Chuck was telling us, uh, a couple of months ago, probably last year, I would bet by now, uh, about the guy who was on that show saying my wife isn't, you know, isn't uh, doesn't measure up to Proverbs 31 or whatever. You you remember you telling you us about that? It was Dr. Phil, right? Uh, yeah. And uh, you know, there's a perfect example of how you shouldn't use this. Right. First off, publicly shaming your wife by going on television. Not that. Uh, yeah. Second shaming off, shaming yourself by going on Dr. Phil. Second off, <laughs> shaming yourself, <laughs> and not just no 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 screw that, shaming yourself by so drastically abusing scripture, uh, you know, and then, uh, I mean, so many other things, but let's keep going here. Um, it's also not an eternal standard, okay? Oftentimes in the Bible, uh, the Bible doesn't clear, let me clarify what I'm saying. These are still good things. The specifics uh, are, are somewhat outdated in some areas, because that's just not what the culture does anymore. Like, where it talks about um, having the... Uh, she is like the ships of the merchants. Well, we don't have really. Yeah, we don't really. It, yeah. Things have changed a little bit. Okay, uh, <laughs> we don't really wait out by the by the bay for the for the merchant ships to come over. You know, I mean, we have them in our WalMarts now. <laughs> so it's a little bit different. Uh, uh, anyways, um, so uh, but then also there's the thing that that you know the culture was different back then, and a lot of things have changed. Goodness sakes, what's wrong with that dog? It sounded like it was getting tortured. Uh, uh, but the women's role has really changed in a lot of places, you know, like America, for instance. So there's some things that just don't really, in, in the Old Testament generally, about women that just don't really transfer one on one. Um, actually, in the New Testament too. So it's kind of you kind of have to remember remember the context of what's being said. Um, it's also not necessarily for just for wives or for soon-to-be wives. Okay, um, depending on how you translate this um, about about uh, what he's saying here, it actually might be um, the woman is not a woman at all. It's the personification of wisdom. Remember earlier in, earlier in Proverbs how wisdom was yeah. shown as a woman. Um, it might actually be doing that here too. It's traditionally been held as talking about a wife of good character. But that might not be what it was originally talking about. So we have to kind of look at that. Also, it might be kind of a combination of the two. Talking about a wife of good character in broad terms, you know, not necessarily laying demands of what a woman has to be, uh, while at the same time uh, hinting towards the fact of, of wisdom as a person. Kind of, like the, kind of like saying this, be wise even as wisdom. So keep that in mind. Um, so, with that being said, there are things in here that are instructions for men and women. Kind of weird, huh? Also, if we look back on Proverbs, I mentioned this last week, the rest of Proverbs is to men and women, if you think about it. So, it gets kind of past, you know, a lot of times what we heard all growing up. Um, then, also, it's written what's in what's called acrostic. And what that means, basically, is it is written in, a, in, in the form of poetry, 
and each each of the lines starts with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So if you notice, like, it, it seems like there might not be a distinct order of, of this section. That's because there isn't a distinct order of, of the section. Uh, e, it, each of the letters starts with that with that letter of the alphabet. I mean, each word starts with that letter of the alphabet. Okay, it's called an acrostic. Um, another example of this is Psalm 119. It's broken up into the different sections: Aleph, Beth, Gamil. Um, they all start that those sections start with that letter. Aleph starts with an Aleph. Beth starts with a Beth. See what I mean? And so that the first letter or word of that sentence is going to be that letter. Um, does everybody kind of understand what that means? Okay, cool. Um, and so the, as a result, there's no real set pattern. Um, it doesn't mention emotions. It doesn't mention the wo the woman's emotions, what she should or shouldn't have. It doesn't ma mention her intellectualism, whether she should or should not be pursuing like a thinker, for instance. It doesn't mention these things. Uh, it doesn't men mention her religious life. So we know it can't be a, a, a mold for all things that women should be because it doesn't mention any of these things. Um, uh, is it right or wrong for women to pursue wisdom? See what I mean? It doesn't really directly address some of these questions. Now, obviously, Paul does later in 1 Timothy, for instance, where he says, let a woman learn. Let her learn. Um, but, I mean, that's thousands of years later. Or a thousand years old later. Um, so then, uh, it also doesn't talk very much about what kind of relationship she should have with her husband. So this is not a one-stop shopping of, of every time you, when you're picking out a wife, this is w what you have to <laughs> check off the list for, okay? Um, a lot of times, traditionally, and why I'm really beating this into the ground is because men have traditionally um, lorded it over women and kind of been overly critical of the woman. And... Um, so I feel like it's only fair to address those hundreds and hundreds of years of imbalance with a little bit of clarity. So, uh, thousands of years, I guess you should say. Um, <clears throat> so that takes us to the actual Proverbs 31. An excellent wife, who can find? She is far more precious than jewels. Now, first off, this is exactly what Paul is going to say in his writings. Character and wisdom are better than looks. It's the character of a woman that's to be praised. Notice that, okay? Not if she does everything perfect, not if she's the most beautiful of all creatures in the world. Right. It's her character, okay? An excellent wife who can find she is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. Now, 11 and 12 kind of have a similar connection there. She's trustworthy. Right. See what I mean? She's trustworthy. And in verse 12, uh, especially, she cares for the best interest of others. It's kind of a self-serving, I mean, not self-serving, an others-serving thing. If you read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it talks about this. Love does not cater to self, basically. I mean, you can go through 13 and it says, 1 Corinthians 13, and it breaks all those things up, but they don't want to waste the time. Um, so she's trustworthy. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. Um, so obviously that, that brings to the, brings to, to the point um, the place that a husband should definitely put in her, in his wife, you know, as men, as husbands, we have to make sure to give respect where it is due. You know, what I mean, if a wife is deserving of, if she's it has proved herself as not being a liar, why treat her as a liar? If she's proved herself as a hard worker, why treat her as though she's lazy? So I mean, treat her as she has deserved. Like I'm not saying that. Let me reword that because it sounds like so she's a a bad wife, you reprimand. You know, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that honor the things that your wife does right. You know what I mean? Respect her in the things that she does right. Obviously, this goes both ways too. When when your husband does something right, you know, you, you want to do the same thing there. Um, and Jesus even said that when he said, "Treat others how you want to be treated." You know, that kind of that idea. Um, so, it cares for the best interests of others. She does some good and not harm all the days of her life. Um, Verse 13, she seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She is like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. Uh, she rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maid maidens. Now, a lot of this is, is lost in, in, in through time. But the idea here with 13 and 14, she seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. Basically, she's a hard worker. Yeah. Um, she, she makes things for the household that's needed. Okay, she works with the with the servants that are in the household. She she works together. She uh, brings things about that need to get done. She's like the ships of the merchant in the sense that, you know, she 
well, I mean, I already said this. She, she takes care of business. So in verse 15 here, she plans for the future. She rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. She, she, her servants, everyone everyone who's, who's in her employ, she takes care of it. Okay? And obviously, you can see how, how strongly this relates to Lady Wisdom that we looked at. So, so strongly it relates to her. Uh, verse uh, 16 then. Uh, she considers a field and buys it with the fruit of her hands. She plants a vineyard. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. Um, so she's not lazy. Exactly what Proverbs already told men that they shouldn't be, right? She puts her hand to, hands to the distaff and her hands uh, hold the spindle, basically uh, sewing. I don't want to get in too much into it, but let's just clarify this sewing. <laughs> she opens her... Also, um, I want to clarify this too. Some things have been deemed as, as traditionally feminine, like, for instance, sewing. But that's not exactly fair. In, la in past generations, men were also sewers because you had to mend your clothes. Um, it's a skill. I mean, just because something is seen as a more feminine skill... Right, that's what I'm saying. Not just because it's seen as a more feminine skill doesn't mean that it makes you a woman, woman as a man who sews, and it doesn't mean that you're not a woman if you're a woman who doesn't sew. Right. Um, because what has happened in the church, especially a hundred years ago, is women had their role. They had to stay in the house, and they had to sew. They had to cook all the meals. Right. That was just how it was. They didn't have any say-so in any of the decisions that the husband was to make. They still do that in the Mennonite. They still do that in a lot of places in America. Yeah. They still teach that in a lot of places in America. And that's why I'm really pounding this into the ground. No. <laughs> just no. <laughs> And in fact, this is kind of breakneck for a lot of the things that women were allowed to do later and, and whatnot. So, um, <clears throat> she perceives that her ma uh, I'm sorry, yeah, right there, 18. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable, her lamp does not go out at night. Now, this can have two different ideas here. Um, the first, she burns the night oil, as they say. Her yeah. light doesn't go out at night, she's, she's working. Yeah. Or, it can also mean that um, her lamp doesn't go out, she... They're not in want. They they keep the lamp burning because they're they're not in want. They they it's not like they have to spare the oil. Right. Okay. Um, I kind of think prefer the first meaning. Yeah. Um, because it's more like you know she she's a hard worker, and that kind of seems to fit with what other with other things that she's saying here. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. You know, once again though, that not necessarily because with the cross sticks it doesn't have to connect. Remember, it's poetry. But with that being said. It doesn't really make sense if she's if they're saying yeah she wastes oil at night after he just said that she's careful not to waste stuff so it's like well uh, uh, yeah I don't I think that fits I, I think it makes more sense to say that she's burning the night oil um, but notice in verse seventeen I want to backtrack here uh, the things that says there she dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong um, does anybody have another translation they can read you I think do seventeen uh you uh, seventeen she says about her work. Vigorously, her arms are strong for her tasks. Yeah, I like that translation actually a little bit better. The ESV, I think, is a little bit too repetitive, and I think that really opens it up more. Um, this is meant to be poetry, and they, they translate it in a very rigid way. Just like <laughs> <laughs> It's like when you read um, when you read the Iliad or, or the Odyssey by Homer, um, it gets really dry. The thing is, it wasn't meant to be read like that. You know, you, you go back and you read it how it was written, and it's like, wow, it's a lot better, a lot easy to remember and stuff. And you read it in English, and it's like, ah. Um, let's just say poetry doesn't translate well. <laughs> Anyways, uh, wasting too much time here. She puts her hands to the I already said that. Verse twenty. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She's charitable. And uh, verse 19, I already said this, she provides clothes for her family. Uh, she is not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. Scarlet, once again, is a sign of wealth. Um, so if she's prepared for disaster and helps those who aren't. It's basically the idea there. They're, they're, not, they're, they're, they're prepared. See, they're, she, op uh, she opens her hand to the poor, helping those who aren't prepared. And then 21, she is not afraid of snow for her household. She, she's okay with it. She's, they're prepared. Verse 22, she makes bed coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Uh, her husband uh, is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. I want to stop there real quick. Um, let's look at this real quick as what we've looked at. First off, a woman is portrayed as capable. I think that's kind of important because later, uh, women, the role of women has 
come and gone in some places. And in and, and, and Greece and stuff, this is actually going to be something that, that comes back up. In fact, at the time that Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, women were not allowed to publicly speak in the congregation. So Paul had to address certain things and had to um, also encourage women to limit their freedoms as well because that was the culture that they were in. See, so as far as what is the ideal here, I don't think that Proverbs is necessarily saying the ideal place of a woman in society. But I do think that it is hinting to the fact that women are co completely capable. They're able to lead. We've seen that multiple times throughout here. Um, they're able to work outside the home. I think we've definitely seen that that is, that is, that is something. Uh, see, because what people do is they get confused. Is the Bible telling the ideal of what women, women, the place of women should be in every culture for all time? Or is it saying this is the culture that you're in, and this is how you do things in such a way so, so it'll show Christ? See what I mean? Because we're oftentimes called to surrender freedoms. Right. For the sake of others, so is Paul and all those other writers. Are they inherently saying that women have to conform to this for all time, or are they just saying, because of your culture, this is what you have to do? We are look at all the other things in the culture of what was written at the time. Why do we suddenly get weird when it comes to the place of women? So then, people inevitably ask the question: two questions that have come up, especially here: A, can a woman prophesy? Absolutely. I don't even understand how you take Why? that, how that's the takeaway from fourteen, chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians. And the second thing is, can women be leaders? Can they be pastors? And there's nothing in the Bible that says no. So let's keep that in mind. At Paul's time, it was more common for men to be, but he didn't say women cannot be in leadership. You see what I mean? Now, there, he did give some qualifications. A wife cannot um, publicly recommend and, and have dominion over her husband in the church situation. So if the wife is the pastor, she has to make sure not to do things publicly to shame her husband. But with that being said, husbands probably shouldn't publicly shame their wives either. So I don't see how that means women can't be pastors. So um, active in domestic life as, as well. It definitely shows that she, she's fully capable of being the domestic, you know, the household, the, the, that kind of stuff. Um, business world. It shows her able in the business world, okay, in the business world, and it also shows her as capable in the in charity. So it shows her in all these different realms being fully capable. And so we're left with the question: Why did the culture, especially the Jewish culture, li culture limit women even more so in the years after this? By the time of the Jesus, women were were limited way more than they were at the time of Solomon, if this is accurate as to what was actually happening. We're left with some really big questions. Um, obviously, the Bible never directly said, hey, women should be equals or whatever, anything like that. But it did give us things that, when understood in its culture, help us to understand how, as the culture changed, so does the place of women. So we should keep that in mind. Um, so, verse 23 then, her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. Uh, basically, they rise to the occasion and pursue success. There's this whole big thing here that, that he's hinting to about uh, the husband getting involved with um, the politics of the city and that kind of thing. Uh, but the main takeaway here is they, 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 you know, they get involved with stuff. They earn respect, and as a result of them earning respect... They earn positions. You know, I don't really want to get any more into this because I don't really want this to be a, a, a to waste the time on that. Verse twenty-four: uh, She makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchants. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. Um, so there, she earns respect by her wisdom and good character. I already mentioned that. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household, and she then does not uh, eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. So there in 28, um, give praise when praise is due. I already mentioned this. Do your best, obviously, is another takeaway from that. Um, not just for the wife, but for the husband, for the children as well. You know, rise up and do your best, I really think is what it's hinting at there. Um, and then also, she perse perseveres in doing right. You know, oftentimes, uh, 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 the, the people you receive the least amount of praise from is the people you're closest to. You know, you know that? 
but yet she persevered all the way up till till her children and her husband are praising her. She persevered past the odds, past the past the all, all the reasons that she could have given up. You know what I mean? That perseverance, I really think, is is a key part to this whole thing. It doesn't say that she got gung ho and went at it. It says that, that this that she dwells with wisdom, basically. You know, you can compare it there with what it was saying earlier with later Lady Wisdom. Um, so do your best. That, that's obviously throughout the, throughout the chapter here. Um, give praise and praises. Do that specifically here. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is, and then that 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 closes up uh, the statement there. Some people have attributed 30 and 31 to what the husband is saying. Um, that's not very accurate. It's it's a conc it's a conclusion statement. In other words, he's it's concluding the the section about the the wise woman. Okay, so the main message of it is first off. Um, holiness and good works uh, are, are the, really the, the the praiseworthy thing. Look at 30. Charm is deceitful. In other words, uh, being enamored, enamored by someone doesn't, uh, I mean, it causes us to overlook things. You know, some people talk a real good thing. That we, we fall in love with them, you know, and as a result, we just kind of kind of uh, see what we want to see, you know. And then, uh, and beauty is vain. In other words, good looks don't last. I mentioned this before. We hit our we hit our, our the peak of uh, of our good looks around like 22, most of us, and then we start to decline around 28 to 32, somewhere in there. You know, we start to kind of age. You know, don't take this the wrong way. <laughs> Basically, what I'm saying here is we have a very short time of being really attractive people. You know, then wrinkles in, we start losing hair, we start turning gray, that kind of stuff. And I'm 25 and I'm already losing my hair. So you can see what I'm saying, that it just, you're not guaranteed to, yeah. you know what I mean? Char what does it say there? Beauty is, is uh, beauty is vain. Anyways, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. There's the holiness part. Because we looked at Proverbs, which, what fearing the Lord is, right? But then in verse 31, give her of the fruit of her hands. Good works are to be praised too. And let her works praise her in the gates. Her good works declare what, who she is. She doesn't need to defend herself because her, her good work shows itself. Um, so that's really the end of this. Uh, praise for what she's accomplished by herself, not because of her husband. This is incredibly important. The, head, the husband is the head of the household. She's not leeching her, her respect off of him. She, by herself, has given herself a good name through her hard work. That's an, a very important thing. I mean, I don't think now in today's culture we don't get what it's saying here because you know we've got the feminist movement and we got this, that, and the other thing, and all this nonsense going on. We miss the importance of what Proverbs is actually saying. Instead, we've, re we've reduced this whole section of Proverbs 31 to say, "This is the wife I need to look for, and if my wife doesn't measure up to her, I need to point her in this and say, hey, you know. Get on, what?" Get on Dr. Phil. <laughs> Get on Dr. Phil, exactly. And so I, I think that that's really not fair. Um, it's also not condoning spouses not being submitted to each other. It's not saying she goes out and does these things without asking her husband what she should do. In the same way, husbands shouldn't go out and spend all their money in a way without asking the wife. You know, it, it's, a, it's a mutual bond. The, the great thing about marriage is it's about us, not I. You know, I, I've, I've heard it compared to, it's like a, a giant sandbox, except there's nothing in it. And each of you have to put stuff in the sandbox. You know, oh, well, that kind of takes the pressure off the other person to be perfect. You're not molding the other person to who you want them to be. You, you marry someone according to who they are, not who you think that they might one day be. And then you work your best at making the marriage the best. And then you just have to hope and pray that they do the same. Mar no marriage is, is, is doomed to fail as long as both people are seeking the benefit of the other. Um, I would say as long as one person is, but that's just not true. Your spouse can divorce you and you can have no say of it. I mean, that's just how it goes. Um, not everybody gets divorced wanting to be divorced. Um, so anyways, uh, that takes us to, to the question that I, I've been building up to for all. What is Sheol? What is that? Anybody know? Any ideas? Are you right now? Yeah. Oh, I always, I grew up Always being told that it was hell. Okay. But as from what you were talking about, uh -oh. completely about hell, I I have no idea. Okay. Any other ideas? Never heard of it. Never heard of the word. Uh. -huh. Oh, okay. I'm gonna say it's easier. Okay. Nicole, you got anything? I'm same way as you. I always thought it was hell. Okay. Well, it's not gonna be an easy answer. 
okay? So first off, let me start with a few questions. Uh, some people ha have assumed that it's like a limbo. It's like a... Um, uh, uh, yes, yes, exactly, like a purgatory. That everybody who died before Jesus went into this place. And that then, after Jesus came, he went down in into this place and preached to them... And they had the opportunity to then accept or deny him and go on. And this is taken from one ambiguous passage in First Peter. First Peter, I believe it's First Peter. It might be Second Peter. It's one of the Peters, um, where he's talking about um, the, uh, the the time of Noah and, and that kind of stuff. And here's my thing: you can't really establish a real firm tr doctrine off of something that is only mentioned one time and ambiguously worded. It could be saying that, yes, but it could also be saying that Noah was a proclaimer of righteousness by the, or that he was preaching by his lifestyle. In other words, Noah was such a righteous person that he was a testimony to the people who are living ungodly. See what I mean? But it also could be that an angel was preaching at the time of Noah for them to repent. It's kind of difficult to understand exactly what's being said. And so because of the confusion that surrounds that passage, it's not wise to then say, yes, that this is affirming this doctrine. Because a hundred other times in the Bible, it talks about that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Okay. It talks about that we only live once, and then we face the judgment, right? Uh -huh. That it, it never once says uh, that people went to some limbo. Look at the story that Jesus told where, with, the, with the Lazarus who, who went to hell. And he's suffering. He looks up and he sees his servant who he mistreated all those years uh, with Abraham. Uh, you know, so is that, you know. Uh, then, uh, well, what about when, when Jesus was dying and he told the guy that he'd be with him in paradise? Well, that's a word that's oftentimes associated with heaven. So it doesn't necessarily mean there's another realm outside of heaven that right. these people went to before heaven, okay? Um, there's a lot of other things like that that it's just, it's too ambiguous to say, yes, there was this other place, this limbo that people just went to. It doesn't really fit at all. Um, then, uh, is it a place where where people where we cease to exist? Jehovah's Witness teaches us basically at death, the person ceases to exist; they go into the dust. And then there are certain individuals that are resurrected. But if you're not one of those inter uh, those who get resurrected, you'll never know because you're in this eternal soul sleep. That you 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 exist in God's memory, but you don't go to hell. You don't go to heaven. You just Okay. So, for that, you have to see that Sheol is nothing but the grave. That context never requires anything else than Sheol means the grave. That's the only way you can arrive at that conclusion, which is actually one of the things Jehovah's Witnesses do. This word only means this. Well, no, we even we do this in English, too. A word can mean something different according to, con to context, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. right, right. Um, so we really have to look at that. So that really doesn't justify either. So let's look at a few places that it's mentioned. Jonah 2.2 2 is one of those places. What? Jonah War 2.2? 2, 2? Jonah chapter 2, verse 2. You don't have to turn there. If you want to, you can. Absolutely. Whatever. Uh, it says, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, you know, obviously this is Jonah. He's, he's, he's run away from God, and he's been swallowed from the, uh, by this large fish. Um, and... At this point, he, he repents, and this is what he says. I, excuse me, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. And basically, it sounds like what he's saying in this context is, is from, from, the, from, the, from the depths of death, I had nothing going for me. I, I, you know, I was in this, in this fish. I didn't think I was going to make it out. But I cried out to you, and you answered me. Um, another thing that could could, could be um, saying is he could be saying that the fish itself he's likening the fish to the grave and that he went under in the grave the fish being representative of the grave he could be seeing that too um, but either way that doesn't mean that Sheol means that we cease to exist as the Jehovah's Witness would, would then claim uh, now let's look at Psalm 1610 now this scene Psalms uh, seems to give some support to what Gracie was saying about it being likened to hell now, once again, though, Sheol means different things in different contexts. So whereas Sheol might mean hell one place, it might mean death or the grave in another place. See what I mean? 
So you really have to pay attention to the context, which is what Jehovah's Witnesses hate doing. They hate paying attention to the context. You know, Sheol, no, Sheol means the grave. Only ever does mean the grave. Yes, it does mean the grave. Majority of the time, it means the grave. Right. However, it, according to the context, it can mean something else, too. Um, okay, and also, just because it does mean the grave the grand majority of the time doesn't mean that that means we cease to exist once we die. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, uh, Psalm 1610 says this, uh, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. See, it seems to imply here, the, I think it's, it's David here, uh, he, David seems to imply that, that, that Sheol is not a good place to be. Right. See, look how he says this, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol. Well, if Sheol is just simply the grave, unless David is one of those people who are going to be resurrected and, and he knew, but how did he know when nobody else knows? Right. It just doesn't. I don't really think that, that, and it also doesn't fit with what he's saying here. I'm going to sing before all of Israel the song that I sing. That basically, I'm one of the few who are being resurrected, and all y'all are just going to cease to exist. You're just, you're well, screwed. right, and that also contradicts everywhere else in the Bible where it talks about hell being an actual place. It talks about eternal torment. It talks about separation from God. It talks about all these different things. You know, it talks about Satan being thrown into the lake of fire. You know, what? How do we reconcile all these things if they don't exist? That basically means that Jesus is a liar, and if he's a liar, then he can't be trusted in any of the things that he says. In other words, we can't guarantee that we're going to be resurrected either. <laughs> see what I mean? <laughs> so with that being said, um, or let your Holy One see corruption. See, it's a parallel. Corruption and Sheol are, are, are parallels there, which seems to imply that Sheol is more than just the grave. Death and the grave, and yeah, absolutely, but it seems like it's more than that. You know, but then also in twenty three six, he's going to go a little bit step further. He's going to make it sound like um, de death is or Sheol is a place that, that, that for judgment. Okay, in other words, hell. Now twenty three six. <clears throat> Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. But how can you dwell in the house of the Lord forever if he was going to Sheol? How, where would the contrast be between the rewards of the righteous seeking, serving God and the rewards of the sinful going to Sheol? That, see, it seems like there's a contradiction if Sheol is just death. But then in other parts of the Old Testament, you can tell that the person didn't believe that there was an afterlife. Look at, look at the account of Jacob when he thinks that Joseph is dead. I'm going to go down to Sheol with a gray head, with, with weeping, I'm going to go down to Sheol. Now, there's two understandings. One is, he thought that God was angry with him, and so that he wasn't, he wasn't, God wasn't going to save him, that he was going to go to hell. Why else would all these bad things happen to him? And he, it's not recorded that he seeks after God again until he finds out Joseph is alive. So that is possible. Another solution is that he's just simply saying, I'm just waiting to die. I, I, I'm overcome with sorrow. I'm just waiting to die. Both understandings are completely reasonable, and and neither understanding means that he see, he thought that he was going to cease to exist. But with that being said, um, he wasn't teaching doctrine. He was just simply saying what he felt. Right. He. I mean, if if, if he's teaching doctrine that that Sheol, um is is <clears throat> just death and everything. Well, then that means, or that, that uh, there is no afterlife, and that means that he's also teaching doctrine that whenever we lose a loved one, we should give up on life. Right. See what I mean? Well, he's not teaching that, is he? Well, no, because the rest of the Bible clarifies. So then we can't take Sheol as, 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 being, as being that then. Um, so we have to understand that people in the Bible sometimes say things that aren't necessarily true. And sometimes they don't have a full understanding. I talked about this with the prophets, where they prophesy, but they don't necessarily understand the full extent of that prophecy. Okay? Um, and then 40, Psalm 49, uh, 15 is another good example of this. Okay. But, uh, but God will ransom my soul from the power of Sheol, for he will receive me. I'll be ransomed from Sheol. I'll be ransomed from death. I'll be ransomed. In other words, I'm not going to hell. I'm going to heaven. <laughs> I trust that God's going to save me from hell. So, yes, it does kind of carry the, content, the idea of hell in some places, but without the full, full revelation that Jesus would later bring. See what I mean? So there was a lot of things that they didn't know and they had to stand in faith without any guarantee that there was an afterlife for them. Kind of a kind of a difficult place. Um, some people in the Old Testament didn't have the revelation that there was a, a resurrection. That they absolutely, in fact, uh, the Sadducees are a perfect example. The, the two parties, Pharisees and Sadducees, the two main parties that come about at Jesus, right? And these are perfect examples of the two main understandings of 
how to interpret the Old Testament. The Sadducees said, well, it looks like in taking the evidence of the Old Testament that there is no afterlife. And the Pharisees went the other direction. Well, it seems in taking the direction of the, of the Old Testament that there is an afterlife. See what I mean? Yeah. And so there, it was ambiguous in the Old Testament. There wasn't a clear teaching about the afterlife. Everything was kind of in cloak and dagger. Until Jesus came, he clarified things. Yes, there is eternal punishment for the wicked. Yes, there is eternal salvation for the righteous. Yes, I make you righteous, not your works. See, a lot of these things Jesus brought clar clar uh, clarity to. Um, so, uh, context guides. Often death or the grave it can also be, is often associated with the idea of judgment, uh, seeming to imply hell. Um, there is no one-for-one for one equivalent with interpretation. I cannot say this enough. There is no such thing as a one-for-one one equivalent of interpreting. It just doesn't exist. Sometimes things are a little bit hard to understand, and we just have to be okay with that. Um, which is why it's important that we read the whole Bible. See, the New Testament depends on your knowledge of the Old Testament. The New Testament doesn't repeat everything the Old Testament said. It it assumes that you already know what the Old Testament says. It's based off the Old Testament. But then it gives further clarification to some things. For instance, the Holy Spirit, it was a little bit ambiguous. Is that God, or is that just his presence? Well, so G the New Testament clarifies. Yes, the Holy Spirit is actually God. Um, then it also clarified about the thing that it says where nobody sees God, but yet it says that Moses saw God. So they, well, you know, well, the New Testament clarifies what it's talking about there. Um, you know, all these different things. Hell, judgment, all these different things. You know, the New Testament clarifies things in the Old Testament. So, Because a lot of people read the Old Testament and they came to a few conclusions. A, um, slavery is okay. It's okay for women are inferior to men and that kind of stuff. And uh, what was another, another big thing from the law? Um, oh, yeah, and work save us. That, the law didn't say that, but they assumed that that's what it meant. So then Jesus came and he you know, clarified a few issues there. Um, so... Uh, the question of the week, if nobody has any questions or comments. Okay, cool. The question of the week. What difference exists between denominations and does it matter? Okay, next week we're looking specifically at denominations and the different traditions of the denominations. Like, for instance, we're going to look at the Lord's Supper, Communion, uh, the different ways that it's taken, the different meanings that different people have for it. Um, 